Hello there. My name is Keegan, and you're probably wondering where Jake is. I assure you, he'll be out in just a second. But have you ever wondered how you and your Western society got here in the first place? Well, since time immemorial, since history was but merely a twinkle in the eye of Herodotus, man has struggled against the elements for his very survival. He has wandered here and there, over there, and, and under there too. Hell, even went up there, wild. And as he wandered, his body worked and processed chemical energy, which required him to use his growing mental virility to search in perpetuity for sustenance, always sustenance. As does a virus, mankind was and will always be fueled by its need to consume and conquer. Hints to this primordial conquest can be seen in the fossils of early humanity and the very bone structures and teeth of our ancient forefathers. Our lineage, separated from the, well, there's really no other word for them in English rather than Sasquatch. You've heard the transmission correctly. There's nothing wrong with your television set. I did say Sasquatch. That's right. Roughly eight feet tall, walking upright, covered in hair, living in woodlands. The robust Australopithecus is the picture-perfect image of the legendary Bigfoot. I assure you I haven't lost my mind. They're all perfectly dead. Whether or not this brings to mind the question of how long a cultural memory can last is neither here nor there. No, the point at hand is the reported crested skull shape of the Yeti, the skunk ape, the Yaren, Yowie, wild man, grass man, Australopithecus, or Michigan man. If the gentleman in our audience would grant a moment's parlay, do this author just a moment's favor and reach to the back of your head where your skull touches your spine. Do you feel that tiny bump at the back of your skull? Congratulations, Coach Harbaugh. You've got a sagittal crest, a vestigial organ that remains one of the few examples of sexual dimorphism in the human species. That tiny little bump is the cause of humanity regarding itself as a different creature from the rest of the animal kingdom, because what used to be there made it completely impossible for our brains to reach the size required for abstract thought. An enormous chunk of bone, which solely functioned to anchor the jaw muscles to the skull, this organ throttled the mental capacity of the entire genus. Hell, the entire family of primates, save only us, the sole survivors of a family wiped out by, God help us, ourselves. It is, in many ways, a tale as old as time that the strong should devour the weak. But in this particular instance, this was simply untrue. The story of the early human family and its genocidal tendencies is much less the tale of a brutish barbaric struggle for survival and more a 1968 hippie lovin'. To hint at this ancient past, we must compare two similar hominins of the extant variety. Chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimps, found largely in Jacksonville, Florida, and Western Africa, are known for their enormous social units known as troops. Headed by the biggest, meanest, horniest male, Chimps have a mating strategy ripped straight from the textbook of every Hollywood sex criminal's autographed handbook. They fight. They fuck. They fight again. Chimpanzees are honestly horrible animals who conduct themselves in an archaic fashion, relics of a bygone age. As a result, only young chimpanzees lack the sagittal crest required for gaping maws and thus chimps are monsters. The close cousins, bonobos, maintain a smaller sagittal crest, yet their social interactions resemble nothing short a trip to Burning Man. Communal animals, instead of maintaining dominance over a harem of females, bonobos will just nut in each other to say hello. They don't care who the actual father is because they seem to think of the species as one big collective, or at the very least each troop is a sort of communal unit. But not so fast. Don't go celebrating yet, Tumblr. Bonobos routinely hunt for other primates for food and will occasionally slap an ape in the name of defending their monkey fatherland. Rather, bonobos organize themselves as an anarchistic, non-hierarchical unit instead of the chimpanzee fiefdoms. And perhaps this turns some gears in our wonderful audience's head. Questions about the complexity of animal political units, and maybe even wondering about the evolution of our own political and socioeconomic systems out of a primordial alpha version. These questions are, of course, well-founded and worthy of further explanation, so we shall explore them at length. Traditional archaeology and anthropological research posits that agriculture was independently developed at various different points throughout the inhabited continents of planet Earth. Yams in southern Africa, wheat and einkorn in the Zagros, rice in the east. 
Yet many have wondered how and less why this occurred, as the cause, that being the end of the last ice age, is well researched and thoroughly documented. Proving definitive start dates to inventions can always be tricky in archaeology, as it's possible to find an art style which doesn't seem to perfectly match its strata and therefore skews the data. This is true too with agriculture, as biological remains tend to decay far quicker than the tactile remains of human garbage, like pottery or tools, for example. Thus, it is very difficult to find the world's first kernel of wheat or the world's first grain of rice, as it likely exists only in the form of copper light, a polite euphemism for stale poop. Shit science being a story for another time, we can confidently point to the Younger Dryas meteorological event as the roundabout start date for a traditional settled agriculture in a way that we might imagine it today, or at least recognize. Yet perhaps the sharper amongst you have already begun to question that definitive start date for one simple reason. Agriculture appears all over the world at the exact same time. That's anomalous. It's the reason ancient alien morons point to their television set through the pairs of glasses their mothers paid for and claim that humanity was led to civilization by an ancient race of extraterrestrial astronauts. Pray, O oh gods, that I do not need to explain to our audience that no evidence exists for this crackpot theory. Besides, the old ones were here long before any other life on this earth and lie dead and dreaming in their house at Relay. Dead gods tell no tales, and therefore yogg -Sothoth had absolutely nothing at all to do with the human domestication of nature for his own benefit. Rather, it is possible that the anomalous explosion of agriculture across every corner of the globe can be explained by terrestrial and not extraterrestrial means. Pause it for a moment, dear viewer. The East African savanna of a million years ago, the cradle of humanity, the Rift Valley, are one true home. The plains are prowled by monsters that look very similar at first glance than shockingly alien and primeval under further examination. Your relatives do wander across these plains, littered with the loose and torn up droppings of the herds of millions. They scavenge in the torn up fields for the new grasses and mushrooms that spring up under the trampled hoof prints, fertilized with millions of tons of shit. Essentially, wild agriculture. The herds till the fields, they water it with their gallons of piss, they fertilize it with their shit and out of it, mushrooms. Some deadly, some nutritious, and others still will take you to worlds beyond the stars. And it is in this recreational substance that I posit to our lovely audience the stoned ape theory, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the shroom. In a nutshell, the SAT holds that humanity's reduced sagittal crest is the result of a change in our sexual behaviors that was caused by the partaking in recreational cybacillin mushroom use. That humanity learned how to till the soil and plant seeds not to feed his growing belly, but rather to keep him stoned and in a state of orgasmic bliss. The sagittal crest became reduced in humanity over time until it became a vestigial organ, allowing our minds to blossom into what we are today. And with this increased gray matter comes culture, comes complexity, comes society. And most importantly for our tale comes a constant burning hunger to fuel the furnace in our minds. There has never before or after in the history of this planet been a predator as successful as humanity. Without claws, without teeth, armor, fur, wings, senses, or even size, humanity wiped out almost all other life on this earth, not out of spite, but of hunger. <clears throat> the spirit of the Wendigo haunts us all. Every time we lustfully gaze at the meat in the supermarket, which grows more and more expensive day by day, hour by hour, every time our mouths water and our synapses non-consensually fire in response to a sandwich advertisement beamed onto your television screen, we are haunted by that great demon god of the northern wilderness, that hunger that shouldn't be, it always is. Our brains are far too powerful than is justified, far too inefficient to do anything but mindlessly consume. Running essentially on pure sugar, human brains require a continuous supply of glucose, either from carbohydrates or from just literally pure sugar, as you can find in fruit, which led us to subjugate and annihilate nature wherever we found it across the planet. 
our conquering legions marched off in search of the rising sun, and instead settled every corner of the habitable planet. From Tierra del Fuego to the Cape of Good Hope, mankind hunted, fished, and planted his way into becoming the undisputed dominant life form. With few exceptions, every species of animal that preyed upon humans was systematically starved into extinction. There is absolutely no evidence from anywhere in the archaeological or paleontological record that I can find to suggest that ancient humans ever preyed upon short-faced bears at any time in our history. Rather, worship of the great old bear gods remains to this day. Absolutely every single time you look up to the night sky and your eyes wander to the Big Dipper, to Ursa Major, the great bear, and the little bear represent the ancient predatory gods which ravaged our species until the eldritch ones granted us reprieve, and the last monster drew its final breath. Like Tsar Alexander in the face of Napoleon, or the American federal government during the Indian Wars, humanity metaphorically scoured the fields and targeted not the bear's flesh, but its stomach. By hunting its prey into extinction, humanity terraformed our own planet into a shell of its own former self, a wasteland decaying away its lost natural glory more and more every second to this very day. This strategy, however, backfired. Paired with an extraterrestrial impact into the Greenland ice, the Great Hunt wiped out the massive herds of megafauna far faster than they could replenish themselves, and as a result, early modern humanity was faced with a stark choice. Adapt or starve. This divergence in thought and policy is naturally strewn along geological and ecological lines, as you can find northern Maine remains hostile to agriculture to this very day, and hunting communities litter the northern wilderness which serves as the borderland between the United States and the former British North America. Each region's unique geographic features led to differences in settlement patterns and socio-economic development as river valleys tended to become quickly and densely settled, while places such as the Black Sea Plains remained semi-nomadic and pastoral in nature. The conflicts between settled and nomadic societies are so numerous that for the sake of time I must push this topic off for another day and another time, but suffice it to say that nomadic societies posed far and away the largest threat to settled societies until the evolution of plague. In the interest of keeping this video a mere brief overview of the concept, we shall turn our eyes to the southern Andes in South America at the end of the last ice age. As previously mentioned, the human mind runs solely on sugar and thus requires a constant stream of carbohydrates in order to keep the furnace burning. Eating meat is a very easy way to achieve this, as herbivores constantly consume carbohydrates and are thus an excellent source of nutrition. But as was previously mentioned, the required population of megafauna for maintained human consumption proved unsustainable, and the system devoured itself in an attempt to regain stability. Perfectly natural, populations in nature will always thin themselves out when resources prove too scarce, hence natural selection. But when natural selection proves far too slow for the same animal that invented the hydrogen bomb, Nature cannot replenish her stores with enough speed and a mass extinction event happens, wiping out biodiversity and rendering literally millions of years of evolution null and void. This is the price of failure in nature. Our cousins paid it, and if we are as careless as them, then our debt too shall be paid in full. Perhaps filled with a stoic sense of hopelessness that I pray to the gods that this audience never knows, in hunger, in desperation, our heroes turn to the one source of hope left in the devastated mountains of the post-extinction Andes, a simple tuber root that fuels this YouTuber, the potato. Yes, the potato, the spud, the tater. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Potatoes. Potatoes are positively ancient, but probably not how you'd imagine. See, the plant potatoes originally come from is actually poisonous, and you have to boil it in order to make it, you know, edible. But come on, you know, I know damn well that I've eaten my fair share of boiled potatoes, so it can't be that bad. Arguably, the most nutritious form of plant under the sun, the humble tater contains vitamins, minerals, and enough carbohydrates to power your brain. There is a simple reason why the Andean region of South America, what with its inhospitable mountains and unbreathable air, became the center of civilization on the continent in place of the vast river deltas that patch mark the land. And that reason is the potato. The potato never made it across the Darien Gap, so far as I can tell, before Cortez and Pizarro, but the effect that this one simple plant had on the development of society within South America was truly remarkable. While the jungles remain pastoral and nomadic hunter-gatherer societies, the Inca, 
built the greatest empire in the history of the Americas until the founding of the Empire of Mexico. Until the day the Spanish were driven from Veracruz, the Incan Empire, or the people of the Four Corners as they call themselves, were the dominant civilization in the Western Hemisphere, and it was not even close. Powered by potatoes, the Pacha Inca created a society of bureaucrats, professional laborers, and soldiers, priests, and a religion which persists in the sun-baked deserts of the Atacama to this very day. The difference between the potatoless tribes of the eastern continent from the fully tatered Incas is as stark as night and day. I can find no evidence of the written word in the east of Brazil prior to Columbus, yet the mountain empire maintained a class of scribes trained for years in the art of Kipu. <gasps> <coughs> <laughs> a not based tally writing system used to count everything from available manpower to offensive campaigns and stuff and 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 the, the total number of potatoes in the province and it was potatoes that Pachacuti was most was was most interested in as as this was the most common way that the, his peasantry would pay their taxes uh, a monarcho communistic society this provo proto soviet empire which, much like the real Soviet empire, well, it, it literally ran on potatoes. As it took a Soviet citizen literal decades to buy a car, it took the Incan citizens several plagues to buy a horse. Because although several ponies had evolved in North America and only wandered into Africa via the Bering Land Bridge, the first Americans must have been Swedish because they ate every single friggin' horse in the Western Hemisphere. It couldn't have been until Columbus, uh, he, he, until he found, you, you know, India, and brought with him Arabian stallions that the wild herds would return to their native land, America. But this exchange was unequal, as most transactions are, yet this was particularly brutal. 90% of the pre-Columbian population was wiped out by the deadliest smallpox epidemic in human history. The subject has been discussed ad nauseum on the platform, but suffice it to say that America before and after the first contact are as different as chalk and cheese. Now, do me another favor and close your eyes. Imagine yourself in an old velvet armchair by a lit hearth. Hear the crackle of an archaic radio box sing to life and tune into a broadcast featuring the talent of Orson Welles. The night is October 31st, 1963. Is that right? No, that can't be right. It was in the 30s. I'm going to try again and guess that tonight is October 31st, 1936, and much like this program, it's a bit of a practical joke. Yes, for your auditory entertainment, please enjoy the relaxing sounds of a world falling apart, the hands of a superior species from the silent badness that sleeps in the darkness between the dying stars. A production of the literary classic, a uh, I think Jules Verne's War of the Worlds features a story so realistic that the American people have thrown themselves into a state of panic, and a very real insurrection has broken out against the supposed alien occupiers. The streets outside clamor with angry voices, and the cold steel of Remington's being hastily loaded with purchased ammunition. As the window pane glows red by the firelight of hundreds of flaming torches, each lighting the face of a suddenly brazen and determined crusader for the survival and restitution of the human species. It's true. The people were so convinced that genocide had broken out in the New Jersey backyard that they were so willing to will themselves into a state of insurrection to serve as Minutemen against the E.T. invasion. Whether or not alien life would waste time improving the GDP of New Jersey is neither here nor there, as this broadcast is thankfully a work of fiction. But recall the passioned expressions in the firelight of the valiant defenders. Remember that haunted look in their eyes because it'll give you just a fraction of the feeling of the people of Tenochtitlan feels at the hands of the Spanish Empire. They fought on the bridges, on the water. They fought on their homes and in the streets. They never surrendered. The Aztecs were conquered by an overwhelming host of arms and were subjugated and annihilated as a political entity by a superior military force. This military might was not Spanish, but Mexican. 
as to the Aztec worship of the demon god Huitzilopochtli required human blood every day to make the sun come up, and frankly, the peasant class was sick and fucking tired of being forced to be eaten to make the sun come up. After all, the Aztec Empire began with a red wedding and a flayed daughter. But mortality is not often the question of anthropologists, and we must separate our worldview from those of the 16th century. After all, the Mexica were mercifully killed very on, very early on, that is, and spared from witnessing the nightmare that would befall their hemisphere. As man's very mind is hardwired to constantly crave carbohydrates, so too was the old world's identity hardwired to constantly crave conquest. From the North Pole to the South, Europe conquered the entire continent. Only on scattered reservations throughout the northern parts of the continent does exist any semi-sovereign Indian state, and only within the bounds of the United States, therefore making any real sovereignty more of a polite euphemism than a genuine assessment of political reality on the ground. The Columbian Exchange can be seen as an analogous event to Stalin's five-year plans during the 1920s and the 30s, where rapid socioeconomic progress was made at shockingly evil and wicked progress at the cost of human life. Horses returned. Yes, so did all the old world domesticated animals, along with many of the old world undomesticated animals, such as rats. The old world got spices, new animals, and a supply of so uh, a supply of silver so big it would eventually bankrupt the Spanish Empire, and most importantly, the potato. Now, look, you might be confused as to why the mineral wealth would be less important than the imported agricultural products, but need I remind you of the many famines that swept the old world until that very first contact. Variety in diet is one of the most important factors in maintaining a settled population with a positive population growth. Most cities, for most of history, produced less babies than dead people, and therefore required constant immigration to keep the industry functioning, which is discussed at great length in guns, germs, and steel. The seeds of the Industrial Revolution were sown at first not in England or even Germany, but in Peru and Bolivia. I say again, I say again, the potato is everything. It is life everlasting. It is the beginning and the end. It powers us. It makes us strong. It gets us drunk. It makes us fuck. Without the potato, I argue that the human population today would be completely unsustainable and our post-industrial society would be totally impossible. It was delivered to us through the fires of genocide atop a throne of skulls 90 million tall, and when we fail to nurture it, millions die, as in Ireland. And it is in the legacy of that famine that we see the roots of many modern political institutions. For example, the springtime of nations of 1848, which brought down Metternich, the Daver Bonds, and nearly the King of Prussia, can largely be attributed to the potato blight which slept, swept across all of Europe. Agricultural prices skyrocketed and wealth inequality led to acute scarcity of vital resources. This is when Karl Marx penned the Communist Manifesto, which called for a collectivization and mechanization of national agriculture to prevent such a catastrophe from ever happening again, which ironically caused such a tragedy again and again thereafter. It is so that we can directly draw a line from the potato to the instability and great political events of the 19th, the 20th, and now in Ukraine, 21st centuries. The unification of Germany and the resulting Franco-German rivalry would go on to shape the history of the Western world for the next century, resulting in the invention of a technology so advanced that should madness overtake us, we could sterilize the planet faster than the time it takes to bake a potato at 375 degrees F after, after rolling it in oil and spices. Chaos theory is anomalous, and the butterfly effect leads to truly peculiar stories in history, the kind that tales, the kind of tales that only centuries of research can allow to blossom before our eyes. And this spud blossom has led our species out of the fires of natural genocide to the sterile, maddening, irradiated genocide of the most unnatural variety. As economists look forward into their crystal balls in a vain attempt to see the future, many predictions have been made regarding food scarcity in the century to come. Attempting to predict the future is famously a fool's errand, as the United States expected the Russian army to, to conquer Ukraine in two fucking days, and was obviously, gloriously forced to eat an entire live crow whole.
But will generations to come have to consider literally eating crows to for survival? Or will advances in genetic engineering perfect the potato and deliver a heartier, more nutritious crop year after year? Only time will tell. Now, let's teach y'all how to grow some fucking potatoes, right? Though famously nutritious, the potato plant is traditionally one of the most fragile garden plants that the American farmers can export. That's the reason why I'm telling you the entire fucking background of this. Because if you're going to grow it, you need to appreciate it. You have to put so much love into this bud so that you can be happy and well-fed like me. Vulnerable to frost, mites, and soil chemistry, special care must always be taken to ensure that your potato friends are happy, healthy, and naturally delicious. The most important thing when it comes to growing your own potatoes is soil viscosity and chemistry. This is vital, as it will determine how much water your plant can handle without drowning. The sandier your soil, the less water it will hold, and vice versa for clay. You'll want to start preparing your soil the autumn before it's time to sow the saplings in a large container. Make sure to maintain about a 25 to 50% manure to compost garden soil. Now, you're allowed to shit in there. You're allowed to get your friends to shit in there, but you're not allowed to... I don't know. I can't think of a joke. I'm drunk. Um, <laughs> whether or not you decide to go for the clay route or the sand route for your bonding agent is really down to your climate and annual rainfall. If you live in a place that gets a ton of rain, make sure to mix in a little sand in opposite for drier climates. Turn that compost bin over twice a week to ensure a suitable microbiological ecosystem for happy and lovable spuds. Now, trust me, the happier your spuds are, the happier your wife will be, as a homemade potato is the key to everlasting love. Around the time the frost first dies down, you'll want to go out and till the soil. Now, if you own an ox, you're all set. You probably don't even need any further instructions. Get going, Ishmael. This acre has to be seedling ready before sundown. But if you lack your own private yak, you're going to have to make do with a shovel, or more optimally, a hoe. Now, Everyone knows the grass lawns are essentially the highest development of communism anyways, so you should just go ahead and tear that fucking thing up and throw up a chicken wire fence to keep out all the hairs. If, uh, if your wildlife is as large as mine, consider uh, an iron fence or, you know, a flamethrower. The point is, the pest will be as big of a, well, pest as the constant torrential rain or the scorching sun will ever be. Growing a potato is a big commitment and requires plenty of tender, love, and and care to make sure that the plant makes it through its life cycle with a prime, delicious flavor. Once your soil has been torn up once and a proper, sturdy fence has been installed, you can begin to start thinking about moving your soil from the bins to the fields. Now, there's several schools of thought as to how to put... <laughs> Oh God. Oh God. <coughs> oh God. It's, it's all going dark. Now there's several schools of thought as to how to literally plant the seeds in the ground. Some people will tell you that two potatoes in a hole will grow to a beautiful plant. Others say it's best to chop two spuds in half, then shit in a box and plop that in the ground. But these people are both idiots. Now, what you're going to have to do is, is, is get yourself your favorite kind of potato at the supermarket. If you don't have a supermarket, fuck you. Go to start walking. If you have a cool supermarket manager, you'll be allowed to just bite at the different potatoes to taste test which one you prefer. If not, you're going to have to settle for the aroma alone. Now, at this point, you're going to want to take that sack of potatoes home to your UV light in your aquaponics setup. If you don't have a rig already set up, you're a nerd, and you're going to have to set one up, so bear with us. Now, our more experienced gardeners are probably going to be kind of annoyed by this, but bear with me. As we explain to our newer brethren how to assemble their very first seedling cradle. You're going to want to get all the basics, a five-gallon fish tank, a fish filter, PVC pipe, some PVC nipples, 
uh, some plumbing adhesive, uh, and that should form the metaphorical meat and potatoes of the rig. The, your choice of light is really up to you as a, a broad spectrum of opinions <laughs> exist of, of, of the optimal light level for newborn potato plants. But suffice it to say that an LED ultraviolet sun lamp is the bare minimum required. Now, anything else is, you know, excessive, but this is America and no one will stop you if you want to go brighter. But just know you're going to need more fish to make up for the lost nutrients and, and and you know speaking of which the fish now you should probably choose some variety of asian carp such as goldfish for their high uh nitrogen output make sure to hook up the export valve onto the filter to the irrigation tube and add a channel for water to return to the aquarium after being filtered for the uh, for, for the excess nitrogen now, what stage you transfer the seedlings to the field should, again, be relying on whatever time the frost has died down. Now, I like to wait uh, about a week until after the last frost to sow my spuds. And as a surprise, morning freeze can, can, can kill them. They can kill your precious potatoes. So, so it's important to be careful and to keep lots of blankets on hand in case they get cold. Now, you don't want uh, to use this, or rather, you will want to use the same post to hang the, the mite netting as the frost blankets. So, so you just save yourself some time and money, you know? Now, once you've successfully gone and planted your spuds into the earth and fertilized them with your long gestating soil mixture, you think, you know, that's all well and good. Now I get to sit back and relax and kick out my feet and smoke some, you know, and, and wait for autumn. Yeah? Wrong! No, this is the hard part where you're going to be playing plant pathologist, attracting hummingbirds and bees and shit and setting up plants and wildflowers around the fence and diagnosing everything from viral diseases to insect infections. Plant diseases are particularly bad in potatoes, and so you must remain ever vigilant to treat your darling potatoes. Ever list, uh, the ever-growing list of medical ailments. Blight is your worst fear, of course, as a single infection will force you to essentially burn down your entire crop, and possibly even your home. But rest assured that many other ailments from your plant may encounter in its journey from an... For, from, but rest assured... Christ, oh God, I'm getting spots in my vision. But rest assured that many other ailments your plant may encounter on its journey from earth to earth can be treated with a variety of simple homemade remedies. That's right. Most insects and evils, even some mammals, can be repelled by the spilling of beer over a plant. An active mold or fungal infection can usually be treated with a 2 to 1 mil water to milk solution. But you're going to want to use whole milk because 2% is for weirdos. But these can be particularly brutal as dry rot can sweep through a crop before you've had the chance to notice the symptoms. You must remain ever vigilant in ensuring the happiness of your potatoes as it's the health and the well-being. It'll translate into better flavor. Now, if your fence holds, if the wind doesn't bite at the potato soil, and if the blight keeps at bay, and then the rain gods, if they choose benevolence, then a day will come when the time has come to harvest your potatoes. Long after its flowers bloom, either with time, your potatoes will reach maturity. As they're merely the roots of the plants, you may decide to leave the runs of the litter behind in the ground to sit through the long winter, sleeping in the silence for spring thaw. This may result in few potatoes becoming more and more resilient to the cold, and if you find this to have occurred in your garden, congratulations, you're on the way to creating your very own strain of potato. Now, after the harvest, you'll want to wash and store your potatoes in a cold, dark place and monitor the stash to make sure that it doesn't spud too badly. Any spuds that do start to grow in storage, you can could just you know, hack them off and plant them directly into the aquaponics rig for immediate replanting. But if your winter is too long, like mine is, I advise against this because look, it's, it's, it's days before April. I have literally five feet of snow. This is unfair. I won't tell you how to cook a potato, but I will suggest that you eat lots of them. You can choose to use your stash however you choose. This is the essence of free will, after all. But as you bite into its flesh or knock back into a glass of its fermented offspring, remember the twisting tail this tater took to get to your taste buds and thank the gods we have been given such a useful plant as the glorious potato by our wonderful forefathers 
in conclusion, my name is Keegan fucking Skirpan, and I would like to add that furthermore, I'm of the opinion that Carthage should be destroyed. <coughs> 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 I call blood hemorrhaging. Damn it! Hey kids, do you ever dream of being a samurai? It's a fact of history that heroes live longer as martyrs, and Hitchbot is no exception. Hey guys, just wanted to let you know, y'all kick ass. Ooh.